Welcome to another jump punishing, projectile parrying, and tornado DDT episode of What Happened, a show that takes a look at video games, both great and less great, but all with troubled development cycles. I gotta get that out there to try and cut off the amount of what Street Fighter 3 that that game's the sickest. Why would it be on your awful show? I totally get it. If you say Street Fighter 3 to anyone who's grown up with Capcom over the last two decades, they'll nod wistfully while humming beats, b beats, b beats, beats in your head. This is because the CPS3 Stunner and its upgraded versions are looked back on as all-time classics nowadays, which is a stark contrast to the mid and late 90s where Street Fighter 3 was considered a huge financial bomb for Capcom and the arcade business in general. And not only that, it went through a long, protracted development that had numerous twists and turns. Remember, it was going to be a follow-up to the most popular fighting game of the age, and while you'd think there would have been a solid plan put into place to guide such an important project, this is Capcom, who has had a history of things sometimes going off the rails. <coughs> So, it's for these reasons why Street Fighter 3 is now on our stage. And with that, I think you'll all agree... Yeah, that makes sense! So tighten your headbands and rip off your muscle shirts. It's time to find out what happened to Street Fighter 3. Prepare for battle. If you were not alive from 1991 onwards, quick recap. Street Fighter 2 was the biggest thing in the world as it essentially birthed the modern fighting game and reinvigorated the arcade industry with a model that placed emphasis on competitive play. Yeah, there were other combative arcade games before, but let's be real, none of them were Street Fighter. Hey yo, Buzz, Kato, and other guy, did, did you get out of here? This boom caused Capcom's arcade output to double and then triple, spurring them to split off their workforce into various teams who would all make fighting games all at the same time. There were the X-Men, and then the Marvel titles, Darkstalkers, the expected Street Fighter 2 updates, and finally the Alpha series. But there were also the 3D efforts like Star Gladiator, Techromancer, Power Stone, and Rival Schools. And then there was JoJo, Red Earth, Muscle Bomber, Cyberbots, and tons more I'm probably forgetting. Suffice to say, the arcade division was getting burned out, working on so much punching and kicking. And with each team spread out amongst so many franchises, an actual Street Fighter 3 wasn't even being considered. This is because much of the original Street Fighter 2 staff had moved over to the Alpha slash Zero series, which they were very committed to continually polish and update. The story of Street Fighter 3 therefore spawns from a completely different Street Fighter-less source. Tomoshi Satomoto, who had done design work on Capcom's fantasy fair like Magic Sword, King of Dragons, and D&D, was given a small team to create a new, try to be surprised, fighting game in 1994. Not only that, it was scheduled to use Capcom's in-development CPS3 arcade hardware, a board that was meant to push 2D animation to its absolute limit. Satomoto was still quite keen on myths and legends and had originally planned for this project to take place in a more fantastical world. At the time, the game was known under its temp name of New Generation, simply because it was going to be a brand new IP. The problem, however, was that Satomoto and his team didn't have any experience whatsoever making fighting games, and therefore struggled for almost a year with the design process, as well as trying to come to grips with a brand new advanced arcade board, and that wasn't even the half of it. Up until that point, Capcom had one to two producers who were overseeing the entirety of their in-development lineup and would work on all of them at regular intervals. By the mid-90s though, games were being greenlit faster than they were being finished, so the Capcom bigwigs hired an outside consulting firm who advised them that every project should have their own producer, which would help mitigate the workload. Now, while that seems completely reasonable, it meant that Satomoto was promoted to producer and was therefore the only one in charge of the game, which in turn was why it was floundering. So with New Generation without a main director slash designer, it was going nowhere fast, and many outside staffers thought it wouldn't be long before it got KO'd off of Capcom's developmental slate. 
While the team got a much needed boost in staff in 1995, it still wasn't enough for them to hone in on a concrete design and concept. So it was here where it was suggested that New Generation should turn into a street fight as a possible way to salvage it. Now, while this suggestion came from Akira Akiman Yasuda, the idea of it actually becoming Street Fighter 3 was still up in the air. If you've been paying attention for the last three years, you might recall... Alan maintained that yes, in those early talks with Capcom, it was being thrown around that the game would be called Street Fighter 3. That's right, Capcom were actually debating putting that lofty, number 3 shaped crown on a few potential projects, with New Generation finally winning out in the end. That's great news, General. Congratulations! On the contrary, I mourn. Okay. However, as we all know, heavy is the head that wears the crown, so for a game made by a new, inexperienced team to suddenly inherit such a prestigious sequel name meant the pressure was very much on. Fortunately, that's precisely when... Here comes a new challenger! An experienced staff member finally joined the team. In an interview with Matt Leone for his amazing written series Street Fighter and Oral History, Capcom Shinichiro Obata recalled, By the time I came around, the team didn't really have a very clear concept of what to do with the game. They had created a lot of animation patterns and they wanted the hits to feel like they had a real heft behind them to make it look cool when you took damage. But the problem was the team had no idea what kind of mechanics should go into the game in order to make it an interesting fighting game. There was no plan for that and there weren't enough moves for each character. So I ended up joining the team when the game was in that kind of state. Obata came from Darkstalkers and had a solid mind for fighting games, so he was an indispensable addition. However, the complexity of working on the CPS3 hardware was still slowing down development, but once things started to wrap up on Red Earth, Capcom's first CPS3 game, more people were able to join the new generation team and or share their expertise. Speaking of which, New Generation was kept as the subtitle, as it also referenced the fact that they were wiping the Street Fighter slate clean rather than cycling in the same core characters over and over and over again. This was similar to the approach that was used on the first alpha, allowing Capcom's creators to either drastically redesign old characters or make completely new ones. Street Fighter 3 was going for much of the same thing, just going way, way harder, as even Ryu wasn't originally planned to be included at all. Lovable New Yorker meathead Alex was being positioned as the new main hero, which explains why he's given so much prominence in the game's attract sequence. We live back at Coney Island with this dickhead! Show some respect to this boot right here. There we go! There we go! Ah! Capcom second-guessed this move, however, as they were worried about potential backlash over a lineup without a single familiar face, so the Eternal Warrior was added to the ranks. The team then second-guessed that again deep into development, feeling that the roster was still on the paltry side, so welcome to the new generation, Mr. Masters! Also, they were able to just recycle a lot of reuse animation frames, so that's pretty much how Ken got in. Ah yes, animation. Street Fighter 3 was going to have more of it than any other 2D fighting game at the time, which, while an incredible artistic goal, was a costly one. Internally, within Capcom, there was worry that Street Fighter 3's ballooning price tag was becoming untenable, and with the way the industry was moving towards 3D, times were such that it was going to release to a marketplace that most likely had moved on. In an oral history, Capcom USA's Chris Kramer explained those concerns. At that point, the Street Fighter brand was kind of in a rocky place. You know, sales hadn't been good on the latest home versions. The US arcade market was dying, and everybody was looking at what was happening on PlayStation and Saturn. They were like, okay, 3D games, this is the future. And Capcom was leaning in way hard on traditional 2D animation with Street Fighter 3. So it was like, okay, this looks great, 
but it looks like more Street Fighter. It was hard to say whether I thought it would be successful. I think my initial feedback was, it looks amazing. I was then told, oh, this will be CPS3, so we'll have all new arcade hardware. They'll never be able to do this for the PlayStation. It won't be able to do all the animation correctly. The arcade guys always wanted to make the ultimate arcade experience, even though realistically the line was like, hey, put it out in the arcades, it gets popular, and then six, eight months later, it comes home, and then the sales explode from there. He ain't lying. Street Fighter 2 sold over 6 million copies on just the Super Nintendo version alone, and that was a potential problem with Street Fighter 3's long-term profitability. No home console at that time would have been able to handle it. Hell, the PlayStation struggled to run certain CPS2 games with all the animation intact, so what chance did Elena's idle animation have? With six months left to go in the game's development, the team got some much needed additions in terms of staff, including Alpha 2 alum, designer Hidetoshi Neoji Ishizawa, who helped refine and polish Street Fighter 3's parry system. Super Arts and Super Canceling were also last minute additions that the team worked hard to include, and while that might seem strange due to Super Attacks having been around since Super Turbo, it was another example of the team's slow, kinda unconfident design phase. The thing is, there was so much pressure from within the company and from other teams because this was Street Fighter 3, right? You know, this was the sequel or what came after the legendary Street Fighter 2, so there was just no way this game would be allowed to fail, and the team themselves, they were feeling that pressure, but they also felt the sense of obligation to complete what they were trying to do. There was a lot of indecisiveness, there was a lot of back and forth discussion on what to do, and eventually they figured it out. Yeah, maybe we should do this, this, and that, so it took a lot of time for the team to gather its bearings. Unfortunately, despite that passion, when Street Fighter 3 or just 3 machines started arriving in arcades across the world, apathy was at an all-time high. It hit the scene right in the middle of the releases of two lavish 3D blockbusters that were also on their third iterations, namely Virtua Fighter and Tekken, which were attracting crowds no matter what side of the globe you were on. What's worse is that the fighting game Limelight not only had to be shared with these cutting-edge 3D slugfests, but also with other competition like Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter, Darkstalkers 3, and everything from SNK. New generations stuck out, but not exactly in a good way. Players would put in a quarter and see Ken and Ryu flanked by a bunch of newcomers, or freaks, as they were not so affectionately called. The game, due to its origins and how the new team had made it, also felt very different when compared to the likes of the Street Fighter 2 or Alpha series. It was slower and more strategic, whereas almost every other Capcom game in the arcades revolved around insane combos, team-up attacks, and other flashy shit. To casual players, it seemed like every other game was all about offering more moves and bigger rosters, whereas Street Fighter 3 seemed like a step back. Less characters, less options for your supers, less dimensions, and less familiarity. It was basically going against all the arcade trends of the day. So it's because of this that in terms of cabinet sold, New Generation was an unmitigated disaster. And, and, and I know I throw that term around a lot on this show, but it really actually was. The initial version of Street Fighter 3 saw shockingly low sales. I remember seeing the numbers and just being really surprised at how the game just wasn't selling. It felt like we created the worst selling game ever at Capcom. It felt awful. The first run of orders for Street Fighter 3 reportedly hovered at around 1,000 machines. To put that into perspective, the original Final Fight had sold 30,000 and SF2 Turbo 75. In an oral history, several former Capcom employees debated this number, but the general consensus was is that it sold incredibly poorly. So that, coupled with the high price tag of the CPS3 board and Street Fighter 3's overall development costs, which were just over 1 billion yen or 8 million dollars, still very high for a 90s fighting game, that new generation 
failed to ever turn a profit. Of course, a good chunk of this had to do with the sudden downfall of the arcade business in general, because as a principal revenue source, it was quickly being replaced with home consoles. Why drive or take a bus to the arcade to play Tekken 3 that doesn't even have Gone when you can stay at home and experience an even better version that does have Gone? Speaking of arcade ports, there is another reason why New Generation was such a huge blow to Capcom financially. It took almost four years for a home port to be released. Street Fighter III Double Impact was a Dreamcast exclusive that launched in Japan at the end of 1999 and mid-2000 in the rest of the world. While it had plenty of value as it packed in two games, by that time the Dreamcast was already fading in much of the world and Double Impact was made further redundant when a port of Third Strike came out that following October. Ah, yes, the revisions. Second Impact, Giant Attack, was released just a few months after New Generation in the arcades, and it added two new characters, Hugo and Yurian, and threw Akuma in there as a bonus. While seen as a marked improvement, it didn't really move the needle much in terms of getting people to actually play it. Neo G, for his part, was seen as a standout member of the team, and was then given further control leading into the release of the next and last revision, Third Strike Fight for the Future. Despite all the system-wide improvements and additions, Third Strike was still criticized for its bizarre new challengers like 12 and Q, and while many applauded the return of Chun-Li and her body yaddy yaddy, Alpha 3 cabinets would still see the lion's share of Capcom fans' quarters. Obata estimated that when you combined all three versions as well as the home ports, Street Fighter 3 eventually dragged itself over the line of profitability by the end, which is still kinda not what Capcom bigwigs wanted to hear. Remember, this was supposed to be the direct sequel to their biggest arcade hit of the 90s. Every iteration of Street Fighter 2 had been leading up to this. So when it wasn't a success, changes were therefore coming to Capsule Computer's business strategy, and Street Fighter 3's failure was a big part as to why. Former Capcom USA CEO Bill Gardner had this to say about the massive decline for the arcade division. When Street Fighter 3 came out, the home console business was starting to really take off. I mean really take off. And so when we made our monthly reports in Japan, we go over and I'm reporting on a multi-million seller on home console, right? And CoinOp was saying, well, we sold 450 units this month or something like that, you know? And Capcom Japan CEO Kenzo Sujimoto was just, he was beside himself. He was convinced they weren't working and he wasn't quite in touch with the revolution that was taking place. So it wasn't long before those sweeping changes swept across Capcom. Arcade teams were moved onto consoles and were told to either sink or swim. If you'd like to see an example of them very much sinking, check out my Devil May Cry 2 episode. As the new millennium dawned, Capcom made less and less fighters until they were almost completely phased out by 2001, but in the years following that, the general opinion on Street Fighter 3, Third Strike specifically, slowly began to change. This was helped greatly by Japanese players showing off what the game could offer and just how hype it could be. It was different, yes, and if you wanted someone that played exactly like a Rose, Blanca, or Honda, you're kinda shit out of luck. But if you looked past the freaks and acclimatized to the systems and game speed, you found a very deep, very fighting rich experience thanks to all the tweaks and improvements that the team tried to squeeze in. Of course, we can't forget the huge part that the early editions of EVO played in this movement, especially certain uh, milestone moments in fighting game history. Oh hey, that's me! So throughout the 2000s, Third Strike began to accrue this reputation as an underrated masterpiece that was not fully appreciated in its day, as it originally came out during a time where the industry was starting to shy away from fighting games. Now, bearing the Dreamcast version, the game never got a port on anything outside of Japan until 2005 with the Street Fighter Anniversary Collection, and later in 2011, Iron Galaxy's sublime Third Strike Online Edition, which should be re-released! This is not the first or the last time I will ask about this, Capcom! 
Nowadays, Third Strike is often seen by many as the pinnacle of the Street Fighter franchise, from its tactile, meaty feel to its graphics and animation, down to every minutia of its gameplay. But goddamn, did it take a long time to get there. It's really amazing that it started out as a completely separate franchise that was never intended to be the next evolution of street fighting, and it's mind-boggling to think about all the paths not taken. Capcom could have just kept running the Alpha series into the ground until it petered out. Uh, they could have had their own 3D teams make a big lavish sequel, and finally, my favorite, the exploding life bars and slam mastering of SF the movie could have been Street Fighter 3. Just speaking for myself though, in a way I'm glad that Street Fighter 3 had to persevere and fight for the respect that it eventually earned. We'll leave on Obata's words regarding what the team were striving for. You know, there are many different approaches you can take to game design. One approach, which we took in Street Fighter 3, is to design your game around unanswerables. I think with any game, players will search for the best tactic, the best strategy, like if X happens, then you should always do Y. If you do this here, you'll always win. There's competitive games like that, where the match is essentially a confrontation of theoretical knowledge that each player has built up. But Street Fighter 3 is a game that, by design, doesn't have a fixed answer to those questions. There is no best tactic. You can spend your whole life trying to find the perfect theoretical approach to a situation in SF3, but it will never be quite right. You always have to be reading your opponent in the moment. You can't just fall back on your theories. It's a game that lets you search for answers forever. Man, that's some deep ass shit. If you know of any other fighting games that were fraught with failure, let me know in the comments below, over on my Twitter, or Tatsumaki into the offices of the Flophouse VIP Patreon and become a big boss and nominate what I'll be flash chopping in a future episode. See you next time and thanks for watching. Select the one to fight with, get it on. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Think and choose the right ones, get it on. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, yeah. Select the one to fight with, get it on. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Yes, sir. Think and choose the right ones, get it on. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1.